Vegas Gangster Profile, Jerry Anjulu, the boss of Boston. Jerry Anjulu, the underboss of the New England patriarchal crime family, and the boss of Boston, ruled the city for almost three decades. Anjulu is known for his short stature, hawkish features, loud booming voice, and a brilliant mind for numbers. He and his brothers made millions, for, millions of dollars for the Don Rain patriarchal over the years with their vast illegal and gambling enterprises. Anjulu turned Boston from a backwater in the 1950s into the machine that was one of the most lucrative markets on the East Coast. With Patriarch's blessing and the muscle of Ilario Zanino, a.k.a. Larry Bayonne, the Italian Mafia was the real power in Boston's underworld, which was a predominantly Irish city. Gennaro Angiulu was born to Caesar and Giovanni Angiulu, immigrants of southern Italy, Naples to be exact. Angiulu was one of seven brothers. They lived on Prince Street in the heart of Boston's North End. The North End was the first stopping point for all immigrants coming to Boston. It was separated from the rest of the city and was tucked in by the undesirable waterfront. It was a cramped area of tenements and squalor. First the Irish came in the 1860s and 70s with the Great Potato Famine. And then in the 1880s, Eastern European Jews came and they eventually settled in the South End and Roxbury. Then finally at the end of the 19th century, the Italians came. Many would move on to East Boston and Revere and some to the South End, but the majority stayed put right in the North End. The Italians planted their flag and took pride in their territory. They closed ranks in the North End and became the most insolent neighborhood in Boston, second only to Chinatown. Anyone wasn't, who wasn't from the North End would stick out. A young Jerry worked at his father's grocery store on Hanover Street, the main thoroughfare of the North End. Jerry was very bright and a good student. He had aspirations to go to Suffolk Law School after graduating from Boston English. But then December 7, 1941 happened, a day that will live in infamy, as FDR said. The Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, and like every yo other young man in America, Jerry signed on to the armed forces to serve and protect his country. Jerry served with honor and achieved the rank of Boswan, the man who operates the landing craft that brought mar marines and soldiers to island invasions in the Pacific during World War II. Upon returning to Boston, Julio began driving a truck by day and taking bets by night. At this time in the 50s, Joe Lombardo was the boss of Boston. Boston was a diamond in the rough. There was a lot of money to be made, but no one had the vision to make it what it could be. Lombardo was a relic of the past. He presided over the North End like it was some, some small village in the Sicilian hills. When the federal government started putting pressure on law enforcement to do something about this growing Italian crime syndicate, old school leaders like Lombardo got spooked. When Senator Estes Kefauver began calling national crime bosses to testify in front of his committee, panic ensued. Lombardo ordered all illegal and gambling to cease in Boston until the heat died down. And Julu couldn't let all this money pass, so he began expanding his small-time illegal gambling enterprises. Lombardo respected the balls of this kid, but he told him he'd get no protection if something went wrong. Lombardo could see the writing on the wall and retired back to Sicily, leaving Raymond L.S. Patriarca to rule all of New England. Raymond Patriarca was one of the strongest old-fashioned traditional mafia bosses in the history of the mob. His family was one of the strongest, wealthiest, and smoothest running operations in the country. For the first time, a dawn ruled over New England from Providence, Rhode Island, instead of Boston, which became just a satellite for Patriarca. Anjulu took a few small callers for bookmaking and taking bets at a racetrack, but soon with the help of his brothers using their parent storefront at 95 Prince Street to run their business, they decided to organize illegal gambling in the North End. They called Anjulu's headquarters on Prince Street the Dog House because Anjulu's fathers used to sell francs there for a nickel or a penny or something. Jerry was a loudmouth. He could bully people with his words, but at 5'6 and 140 pounds, nobody was physically threatened by Jerry. These bunch of bookies, as the Anjulus are referred to, were more brains than brawn. Only his brother Donato Donnie Angelo was thought of as a man to be feared. They began booth bar dice games, card games, sports betting, horse race betting, and the numbers, which was the lottery before it was legal. The Angelos were racking in the cash, but this also brought undue attention from shocks like Larry Bayonne. Seeing the money that the Angelos were making and knowing they were not connected, he saw a feast before his eyes. 
realizing that Bayonne wasn't going away, and Julu wasn't about to let somebody extort him for his cash. So in a bold move, he put $50,000 into a suitcase, which is basically the equivalent of a quarter million dollars today, and took a road trip to Federal Hill, Providence, at Raymond's office on Atwell's Avenue. He met with Raymond L.S. Patriarca and offered this $50,000 in tribute and promised $100,000 annually for the right to operate in Boston. Now, Raymond had plenty of muscle, but what he didn't have was smart guys that could earn. Seeing the void in leadership in Boston, and the amount of money Angelou was about to stuff in his pockets, Raymond, no doubt puffing on his cigar, was thinking to himself, I ought to make this little shit my underboss. And that's exactly what he did. From that moment on, Angelou was a made man of the Patriarch of Borgato, and he was anointed the underboss of New England, and the immediate authority of Boston. This did not sit well with hardcore mafia soldiers. You were supposed to spill blood to become a member, but Anjulu bought his ticket in the mob with money, not by blood. And some mobsters did not respect that. But luckily for Anjulu, mafia soldiers like Bayonne heeded Raymond's word as law. Gennaro Anjulu, the underboss of New England, and Larry Bayonne, his new capo de regime, were about to get to work. The first move was to organize all bookmakers and loan sharks and let them know there was no more independence. Everyone had to kick up to the mafia now. And Julio had a brilliant idea to let local business owners become agents for him. If they placed a certain amount of bets or took a certain amount of numbers, they could keep a percentage for themselves or roll the money back into their own bets. And Julio was a business genius. Within a few years, Jerry and Julio was a millionaire. He was making so much money that even his godfather Raymond couldn't believe the golden goose he had. Jerry purchased a mansion in the rich, se- the rich section of Nahant in the seedy city of Lynn, Massachusetts. He also bought a club in Boston's red light district, the Combat Zone, called Jay's Lounge. This brought in hundreds of thousands of legitimate dollars. This is where Anjulu conducted a lot of his business during the 1960s. This is when the power started going to Anjulu's head a little. Well, maybe a lot. Doing his best George Raft impression. Now, for my viewers that are younger than 80... George Raft was in the old black and white gangster movies on Turner Movie Classics. Jerry would wear a silk smoking jacket and sit in his office smoking a cigarette out of an expensive cigarette holder. When fat Vinnie Teresa tried to pump counterfeit bills into the city without Angelo's knowledge, he had him brought to his office. While blowing smoke in his face, Angelo said, Meh, so you're the one bringing queer 20s into the city, huh? You might not leave here alive tonight. And Julio relished playing the tough guy gangster. No one ever feared Jerry and Julio before, but now he had real killers on the end of his leech. People feared what he could have others what he could have others do to them. And Julio was the quintessential Napoleon figure. He could be heard berating underlings up and down Prince Street. He had no patience for stupid people. He couldn't believe how dumb a lot of the mafia recruits were. He could be heard complaining, I got a lot of tough guys. What I need are smart tough guys that can earn. In the 1960s, the FBI planted a lot of illegal wiretaps and bugs on organized crime figures around America. After decades of denying the existence of an Italian organized crime syndicate that was infiltrating every facet of legitimate society, the FBI and their Looney Tunes director, J. Edgar Hoover, went balls deep into an information gathering campaign to catch up on lost ground. One such establishment that was bugged was Angelo's Club on 253 Tremont Street. The feds had to get a special diamond tip drill just to penetrate the concrete walls in the underground maze beneath Boston streets. They almost couldn't get it done, but when they did, they found a treasure trove of information. Unbeknownst to the FBI, the New England Mafia was a machine that controlled the legal enterprises from Rhode Island to coastal Maine. Not only did they have multiple law enforcements on their payroll, but they were paying elected officials bribes to pardon Mafia associates of crime. It shocked Hoover how deeply entrenched the Mafia was. Hoover, who was of waspy white old English heritage, thought Italians to be inferior. They weren't allowed to use the recordings as evidence because it was illegally obtained, but it definitely put the mafia in the crosshairs of the FBI. For the next 20 years, it would be the FBI's obsession to take down the Italian mafia, and as the public would later find out, the FBI would go to any lengths to achieve this. After the dust settled on the Irish gang war of the 60s, the mafia sat comfortably on the top of Boston's rackets. The Mafia wisely used the cover of war to eliminate anyone they didn't like, and at the end of the war, Winter Hill Gang was the only other game in town. And Julu, always the chess player, used the hill as pawns in his game. Zanino was heard on the wire saying, The hill is us! We are the hill! But when the Nordorangeli brothers of Medford started their own crew and began bumping into Jerry's interest, he used the hill to vanquish them. 
by using Hill Assassins John Moderano and Joe McDonald, and Julio wiped Indian Al, his brother, and their entire crew off the face of the earth without one mafia soldier spilling blood. Angel and Julio was cunning to say the least. Going into the 1980s, the Patriarcha Borgata was one of the richest, most powerful crime organizations in the country. They didn't get publicity like the Five Families in New York or the Chicago Outfit, but publicity is bad for business. After decades of deceit and espionage, the FBI was about to get some results for their dogged efforts against the Italian Mafia. Federal agents Rico and Condon threw out the rule book in the 60s, and Conley and Morris picked up where they left off. The FBI always made sure that their men rose to the top of the Boston underworld. In my opinion, they were the biggest gangsters in the history of Boston. When Jerry and Julu called Steve the Rifleman Flemmy to the doghouse on Prince Street to discuss a $50,000 loan that Stevie hadn't repaid, and Julu didn't berate him and he treated him respect, not knowing that the whole time the devious Flemmy was drawing a map in his head of the doghouse for the FBI. It wasn't easy, especially in the cramped North End, where someone was always watching, but the FBI broke into the doghouse and planted a bug. There was a lot of background noise, but you could clearly hear Angelou's booming voice. They listened to Angelou and Zanino discuss Rico, which was the new tactic to prosecute the Mafia. It was aimed to take down bosses who were insulated from day-to-day -day operations. The feds themselves were just figuring out how to use it in court. And Zulu thought that it had to do with infiltrating legitimate business, not illegal. He was recorded saying, We're Shylocks! We're fucking bookmakers! We're selling marijuana! Illegal here! Illegal there! Fucking arsonists! We're every fucking thing! Zanino adds, If I called these guys right now and told them to kill anyone, they'd do it! They had no idea they were making the case for the feds. Dejected, and Zulu finally admitted, I don't fucking know! <laughs> They didn't suspect that Steve Flemmy and White double-crossed them. They were heard saying, They're with us. We're together. They're nice people. The type of fucking people that can straighten a thing out, Zanino says. September 19, 1983, while dining at Francesco's in the North End, the FBI arrested Jerry and Julu for racketeering in dramatic fashion. And Julu famously yelled, I'll be home before my pork chops get cold. Unfortunately, those pork chops would get very cold. At his trial, he was heard on tape telling soldiers to stomp and kill people he didn't like. Gennaro Angelou was sentenced to 45 years in prison for running the Boston faction of the Patriarcha family. In his 60s, a 45-year sentence seemed like a life sentence, but the strong-willed Angelou resolved that he would not die in prison. In 2007, after 24 years in prison, Jerry Angelou was a free man. He spent the last few years of his life around family and friends before passing away in 2009. His lawyer, Anthony Cardinal, described Anjulu as a man's man, a stand-up guy who resolved to die a free man regardless of what the crooked FBI wanted. His funeral was a grand procession with the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club acting as pallbearers and leading the procession. Anjulu's name still carries weight in the North End, where some people wish for a simpler time where men like Anjulu kept order. Jerry Anjulu was the last meaningful boss in the city of Boston's history. If you like this video, hit that like button, leave a comment, make a request, subscribe if you haven't. I think we can get to a thousand by next month. Remember, most of all though, take care of yourself and have a great day.